takes me a minute to get all my togethers together. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with brothers and sisters on the first day of the week. There's no greater place that we could be. There's no better place that we could be than with brothers and sisters in the Lord. Brother Mike, in his prayer a while ago, alluded to the fact that the church is under pressure. It's under scrutiny. Uh, they're trying to destroy it, destroy the church and its principles as hard as they can. Um, this week or so ago, I got to thinking about what we could discuss this morning. And the question came to my mind that you'll notice in the bulletin, is the gospel sufficient? That's, that's an open-ended question, isn't it? Sufficient for what? Therein lies the discussion this morning. We're going to discuss several things. I'm not, I'm not talking, and some of the things I'm going to talk about has nothing to do with politics. I don't care if you're a Democrat, I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care if you're an Independent. I don't care what you are. We've got officials, elected officials in our government that's trying every way in the world they can do to pass laws that will tear down the church. And I think we need to be aware of them. Too many times we get caught up in our own little world, as it were, and we forget what that our elected our elected officials are doing to us. So let's think about some of this this morning. To start with, many religious groups today don't even depend on the Bible. As most of you here know, I was raised in the denomination. They talked about and used their creed book more than they did in the Bible. Now, how did the creed book come to be in effect? About every major religion today has a creed book. Is that creed book based on the Bible? Is it based on the Word of God? No. It's based on some man's idea. And furthermore, and even more dangerous, it's based on what they want. That's the trouble with the world today. We're not willing to take God at His Word and do what He says do, or don't do the things He said not to do. We want what we want when we want it. And we want it now. We're going to talk about that. But we need to be aware of these human creeds. And we need to be aware of, at every opportunity... We need to reject these creeds. We need to have in our minds a biblical answer for these people. I have a real good friend who is a member of the Baptist Church. And he and I talk about baptism. The need for baptism. The fact that baptism saves us from or has our sin, washes our sins away. The water doesn't get it, do anything but get us wet, does it? But the act of a good conscience, God forgives us of those sins. He contends baptism is not necessary. How do you get around except you're born to the water and the Spirit, you shall not enter into the uh, gates of heaven? Oh, but Don, you're wrong. How so? Well, that part of it is when your mother's water breaks. I know I thought the same thing the first time he told me that. But he's serious. As a heart attack. Got a question for him and I've asked him. What happens to a baby that's born cesarean? Can he go to heaven? I didn't get no answer. So what I'm saying is that's just one illustration of creeds. The New Testament is sufficient for everything. Most of you know how I feel about Tom Tal. I like him. I think he's a pretty good fellow. But he and I may have it fallen out one of these days. May just have the office jumping up and down, hollering, falling out you ever seen. Well, do you realize that the gospel has the answer for Tom and I to correct that? If Tom and I are willing to go by and abide by what the Bible says. That's the key, isn't it? Abiding by what the Bible says. Not what I want or what Tom wants. You know we got different choices, we got different type women. 
You know, so we've got different type of choices. But the point is, we need to understand that we need to do what the Bible tells us to do. The New Testament wasn't written by men who wanted something and wanted it a certain way. The New Testament was written by men who were inspired by God. There is no save, there is no possibility, none whatsoever of being saved outside of the church and outside of the gospel. It's an impossibility. One of the most recognized verses in the scriptures is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is Christ saying? You're going to do it my way or you're not going to get to heaven. Can you make it any plainer than that, brothers and sisters? You almost have to have help to misunderstand that. So the, the Bible, the thing that we go by, the Scriptures, they weren't written by written by men who were writing what they wanted. They were written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord and Savior said in John 14 and 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that have I said to you. They didn't have to worry about remembering all that they had heard our Lord say for three years. David, do you remember three things that sent, or three years worth of things Cindy's told you? Nor do I carol. It's not an, it's an impossibility, a human impossibility. But through the Holy Spirit, through the work of the Holy Spirit, they were told all the things that the Lord had told them that they could rely on to who? To us. Our Lord also said in the two, ver- uh, two chapters over in John 16 and 13, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit guided the writing of the New Testament. He guided the words that have been left for prosperity, those words that were left for us today. Think about that. God not only sent His Son here to die for us on that cruel cross, when he left, he left a means that these twelve men that he handpicked could relay these words to you and I in the year of 2019. Jesus promised when at his ascension that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they did. Acts 2 and 4 says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You notice it didn't say as they wanted. It said they began to speak with the Holy Spirit. They were guided by the Holy Spirit. Gave them utterance or gave them the ability to speak the things He wanted spoken about. Well, Don, you're getting plumb off of the direction of the lesson. No, I'm not. Sometimes it takes me a minute to get around to it. I want us to understand that this, this book that we have, God's Word, is infallible. Is it not only infallible, it's something that will never pass away till every bit of it has been fulfilled. Think about that. Not one thing will pass away in these Scriptures until they are fulfilled. What is the fulfillment of the Scriptures? When our Lord comes again. Think about that. When our Lord comes again, all that He has said, all that He has left for our remembrance will be fulfilled. Because time, as you and I know it, will exist no more. And existence, as we know, will exist no more. We're told not to add to or take away from the Scriptures. We're admonished that very strongly. If we add to it or take it away, God says it makes us a liar because we're adding to it or trying to take away from that which is already perfect. Now, getting back to creeds, I want you to understand that the Scripture is infallible. The Scripture is what we're to be guided by. The Methodists 
have a creed. Part of their creed, it says, wherefore that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. Now, that's a good sounding verse, isn't it? Think about it. Wherefore that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. Can anybody show me in the New Testament where it's there that we are justified by faith? Scripture says without faith it is impossible to please God. Without faith, uh, without works, faith is dead, as is the body without the spirit. So that can't be right. The Baptists have their creed book. They have an opposition to baptism. We talked about that a while ago. It's not necessary to be baptized according to them. Do you realize it's easier to get into the Baptist church, uh, easier to get into the church than it is the Baptist church? Think about that. It's easier to get into the Lord's church than it is to get into the Baptist church. If you get into the Baptist church, you've got to be voted on. The members there have to vote whether you're qualified to become a member of that congregation. I don't read that in the Scriptures anywhere. And the Lord, the only place that talks about being in, getting into the church, I hear Christians talking about, well, I joined the church when I was 13. No, you didn't. There's not a person in this room who's a Christian that joined the church. We obeyed the Lord. We obeyed the plan of salvation. We were baptized to be raised and walk in the newness of life. And the Lord added us to the church. You didn't join the church. But today, today they have all sorts of things. Now let's get down to things that are affecting us today very, very badly. Do you realize that we have a man running for the highest office in the land, running for the office of the President of the United States, who is openly a homosexual? We have a man running for the President of the United States who says, if I don't agree with him and accept him for what he is, I'm a racist. Because he wants to be that way, and it's his right to be that way. What does the Bible say about that? There are some, like this man, who contend that it's, it's perfectly all right for him to practice being a homosexual. But what does the Old Testament and the New Testament? Leviticus 18 and 22 says this, Ye shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Can he make it any plainer? Could God make it any plainer? Uh, Leviticus 20 and 13. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltless is upon them. How can he say that I'm a racist if I disagree with him when God disagrees with him? Does the New Testament... Have anything to say about this? Romans 1 and 26. For this reason God gave them over to a degrading passion, for their women exchanged the natural function of that which is unnatural, and in the same way also the man abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. But Don, you still haven't said anything about it. It doesn't specifically talk about homosexuality. What is homosexuality if it's not a man lying with a man or a woman lying with a woman? Is that not the key definition? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, if you want the word used. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not... Uh, be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. What is the writer of Corinthians saying? 
that all the people, all the human beings that do these things listed here will not go to heaven. Can anybody say that's an incorrect statement? If you believe that, please bring your Bible after this is over with and show me. Because I've missed it. We need to be aware that this is being condoned by our federal government. This past week, there's a place in New York, they call it the Mother Church of Homosexuality. They had a big get-together this week. This is where they say the movement for homosexuality started in the United States. But I'm a racist if I disagree with him. There are members of our Congress, there are members of our Congress, our lawmaking body in our country, who say that it's all right to kill babies. It's all right to murder babies. It's all right to have an abortion. Can anybody say an abortion's not murder? If you can show me in the Bible where it's not murder, please come show me after this lesson. Again, I'm sadly lacking if that's the case. But we have government officials that are condoning abortion. All oh, but now, Don, you got to understand. There is, you got to understand that that baby in that womb is not really a baby. It's not a human being. Well, what is it? Well, it's tissue. You think I'm being cute? I'm not. This is the idea and the theology beside some. Will you take God's word that that which is in the womb of a baby, uh, in the womb of a woman, is a baby? Would that settle the fact? Would the Scriptures be sufficient to do that? Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew uh, 1. Let's go there and look at that right quick. Matthew 1 and 23. Pages are stuck together. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. What did he say? What is this scripture talking about? What was going to be is the inspired writer here saying was going to be in the womb of the Virgin Mary? Baby. That should settle the problem, but it doesn't. Turn with me to Luke, the first chapter. Look the first chapter. Let's look at verse 13. Here's the account of when our Lord's earthly mother went to see her cousin Elizabeth. Luke 1 and 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall hear, uh, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Here, I'm one ahead of me. But anyway, this is where uh, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was told that she was going to have a baby, going to have a son. And she had to have it in the womb. Let's go on to the same chapter, verses 41. And it came, this is one. And when it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Behold, art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of salutation sounded in mine ear, the baby left in my womb for joy. God had an inspired writer Write this so we could understand that that which is in the ba- in the wo- by a woman's body is a baby. It's not just tissue. Do you realize there's over fifty thousand abortions in the United States a year? Fifty thousand babies killed. Do you realize they're going? Some states are passing laws that they can have abortion. They can kill that baby even after it's born healthy. 
They say the mother and the doctor have the right to decide whether that baby lives or not. It's called genocide. But this is being advocated by our federal government that it's all right to do these things. And folks, this is contrary to God's Word. Thou shalt not kill, the Bible says. We need to be aware of these people. We need to watch these people. And we don't need to vote for these people. I said I wasn't going to get into politics. I'm not. But I don't care whether Republican, Democrat, Independent, or Blue Jays. If they're advocating this, it's wrong. Abortion is wrong any way, form, or fashion. There are people out there, religious organizations today, that say the kingdom of God has not come yet. It won't come until Christ comes back stands upon this earth and reigns for a thousand years. Can anybody show me in the New Testament where it says that the Lord will ever come back and set foot on this earth? Again, if you know about that after this is over with, come see me. Bring your Bible. Because I don't know about that either. If I don't know about all this, I'm sadly lacking. And I need help. But what does the Scripture say? Acts 2, thir- verses 33 and 36. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which now uh, you now see and hear. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, both your uh, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The kingdom exists because God raised Christ from the dead and He now sits on the right hand of God. We don't got to wait till He comes back and sets foot. Because the Bible doesn't say He will. Hebrews 2 and 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with grace and godly fear. If God wants us to worship Him with reverence and godly fear and to serve Him in His kingdom, His kingdom had to have come, didn't it? There's no other way to explain it. But there are people out there who say the kingdom has not come yet. They're still awake. And time's getting away fast, isn't it? So why? So why do we have so many different organizations that call themselves churches? I've lost count as how many there are, but there's a tremendous amount amount of organizations that call themselves churches. And the most of them have even taken the name of Christ out of the name of the church that they are that they are affiliated with. I guess the most unusual name that I ever remember seeing, Carol and I were in Pennsylvania. And on a marquee out front of a building it said Saint Paul's Church of the sorrowful mother. St. Paul's Church of the sorrowful mother. And I didn't talk to anyone, but if I were a betting man, I'd bet you they'd tell you they were Christians. If my understanding of the term Christian means to be Christ-like, doesn't it? To be Christ-like. But yet, man is doing their dead level best to take Christ out of the church. How do you do that? He died on the cross. He shed His blood for the church, to purchase the church. The church was brought into existence on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 souls were saved. 
So why would we want to take Christ out of the church? But they're trying. They're trying. Today, catechisms that the Catholics use will make a Catholic. The Methodist doctrine will make a Methodist. The Book of Mormon will make a Mormon. The manual that the Baptists make will make you a Baptist. The Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, the New Testament will make you one thing, a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. Does anybody here want to be any more than a Christian? Can we be more than a Christian? Is there any better name to wear than a Christian? Again, if you know of a better name that the Scriptures authorize, come see me. Bring your Bible. Sounds to me like we might have all all afternoon study. If I'm wrong. But there are things going on in our society today that we need to be aware of. We don't need to be like the ostrich and stick our head in the dirt in the dirt and pretend it's not going on. Fifty thousand babies are killed a year in the United States. People openly aspired to the highest office in our country and said he says he has a husband. People want to have their way, and they want it now. Think about that. They want their way, and they want it now. What do you want? What do you want this morning? What, if you had one wish granted, what would that wish be? Think about it. Well, you know... If the Lord, if I could, if David could give me one wish, David Jordan, set up here. You know we picked on. If David could give me one wish this morning, I have one wish. That's the Lord to come before I get done. Think about it. Wouldn't Don be better off? Because at this particular moment in time, Don McGuirk is in a safe condition. If the Lord comes before I finish. According to the Scripture, not because Don is so good and Don's so great and Don's so perfect, because he's not. But the grace of God covers Don. But do I know if he lets me live another day or ten years or twenty years, will I be faithful then? If you're not here this morning, you think about it. If you're lost, if you've never obeyed the Gospel, if you've never had your sins washed away, The Scripture says you have no hope of eternity in heaven. And folks, there's only two places the Bible talks about for an eternity. One of them being heaven, and the other one a lot of preachers don't like to use. The word hell. We need to tone that down. Kindly water it down a little bit so it don't sound so offensive. Well, if you go to Revelations and you read the account of what hell's like, folks, it is offensive. It's horrible. So if you're here this morning, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you need first to believe that Christ is and that He exists and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You need to be willing to repent of your past life. If you obey the gospel today, that's not, I'm not telling you you're going to come up out of that water and you're going to be perfectly uh, uh, sinless for the rest of your life, are you, Jeremy? You're not. You're still going to sin. You're still going to have shortcomings. But you have continual washing of God's or Christ's blood to wash away those sins. After deciding to change your life to do what the Lord would have to do, the Scripture says, if you'll not confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. You need to make the good confession that you believe that Jesus Christ he is the Son of God. And lastly, and not least, you have to be baptized, you have to be immersed in water to have your sins washed away. If you know of another way that the Bible says you can be saved without being baptized, bring your Bible after this is over with and talk to me. It's not there, folks. It's not there. If you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, do not leave this room 
without becoming a Christian. Because you might not have tomorrow. Every person in this room, I guess young Miss Bird over there is probably the youngest young lady or youngest person here. She's one heartbeat. She is one heartbeat away from eternity. If her little heart doesn't beat the next beat, she's in eternity. Well, so what kind of shape am I in? I'm 75 and she's young and beautiful. Got lots of years left ahead of her, she assumes. Thank the good Lord she's a Christian. If you're here, your life's not been what it should be. You need to make take care of that too. If you have need of my Lord's invitation, you notice I didn't say my invitation, the Lord's invitation. Please, I encourage you, do not leave this room this morning in an unsaved state. If you have need of my Lord's invitation, please come as we stand together and sing. Our God, gentle voice of Jesus, Christ.